Good morning. And welcome back to Water for Texas 2019. My name is Peter Lake. I'm the chairman of the Texas Water Development Board. And on behalf of my fellow board members, Kathleen Jackson and Brooke Pock, thank you for being here. Today, we're really looking forward to hearing from George Hawkins, our keynote this morning. Uh, in talking to him ahead of his presentation, I was explaining that the Texas Water Development Board, by state law, is overseen by a three-person board. And on that board, you're required to have an engineer, it's Kathleen Jackson, an attorney, Brooke Pop, and the ambiguous finance guy. Whatever that means. And he said, immediately, I love finance guys. It's the first time that's ever happened, <laughs> ever in history. So for, for the bankers in the crowd, this is your guy. Uh, George is an extraordinary guy who's done tremendous things in water. As I mentioned yesterday, he was an attorney in D.C. who had some opinions about uh, how to run D.C. water. Uh, and to his credit, when somebody offered him the keys and suggested he actually run it, he put his money where his mouth was, uh, but that's his story to tell. So please give a warm welcome, George Hawkins. Well, I got the call on the bat phone. So many of us in the business have a bat phone. It was uh, a Sunday night. It turns out that there's a reason that so many calls on bat phones come in evenings and weekends. Because doesn't it always seem that way? It did to me. It's when everybody's home. So residential water use is at its peak in evenings and weekends. And the kind of calls that I would get that would drive us to distraction the most were when things were happening in residential neighborhoods. Well, this was a call on a Sunday night of a three-day weekend. And I lived at the time in the Navy Yard in Washington, D.C. For those of you who know Washington, D.C., or those that you don't, Navy Yard is an area right on the Anacostia River. It was the industrial part, if there is such a thing, in Washington, D.C. That's where the trash transfer stations, the concrete plants, our pump stations, sewer pump stations, a lot of warehousing. Actually built torpedoes there during World War II. There's a big Navy installation. So it's the part of this, it's sort of the working part of the city. And when I got the call, the building I had actually looked north. And I had a floor-to-ceiling window in the living room that looked, and I could see the Capitol Dome. It was directly to the north. And so I was, got the call. It was Alan Heyman, ran our communications and external affairs office. Hawkins, look out your window. So I walk over, do the blinds, and look north. And it was dark red, black-ish sky. It looked biblical. But no rain. He says, well, there's rain to the north. Straight north in D.C., Rhode Island Avenue, 1st Street. It is raining so hard, all the streets have flooded. We're getting reports of basement flooding, street flooding. Flooding so bad that the streets had flooded high enough to float cars that were floating down Rhode Island Avenue. EMS had shown up with their ladder trucks and were rescuing people from their cars from the top of ladders to get them out of these cars before they floated. Who knows where? You've got to get to sight. You've got to see what's happening. So I donned my gear, ran downstairs, hopped in my car, and silently started driving north. Note to self, in the midst of a flood, that can float cars, do not drive a Volt. <laughs> but that's the only car I had. And uh, I hadn't really thought. You know, I, electric car, I'm always in water. Hmm. But I'm driving north in the Volt. It is a silent car. It's one of the odd things about an electric car. It makes no noise. There's these funny things you buy for electric cars now that make noise for deer. Because at the moment, you drive an electric car, no one knows you're coming. So it's funny, they're making fake noise. Reminds me when I was riding a bike when I was a kid, you put the little cards in the front to make it sound like a motorbike. Well, I got little things on the front of my electric car so it makes sound. But I'm driving north silently and then, bam, I hit the water line. The water, it was such an intense, localized storm. It was like a sheet. There was no rain and then 
I was in it. And the rain was coming down so hard, I couldn't hear anything. The pool was pounding on the, the top of the car. Drive up to the north, get stop off on the cars, get nearby, park in the street, get out of the car and start running north. And even as I'm running up, the, the rain is starting to abate. That storm had come through Dureco, I think they called it. But it was this really intense, localized storm. By the time I got to Rhode Island Avenue, there was still a lot of water on the street, but no more cars were flooding. The system had already been able, been starting to stabilize itself. But given that this is DC and this is quite an event, on the street was Channel 4, Channel 7, Channel 9, all the local media, WAMU, they were all on site. The mayor's office was on site. Kenyon McDuffie, who was the ward council member from that ward, that's Ward 5 in DC, was on site. So I started going out and talking to people who were out Rhode Island first. It's a big intersection of where a lot of people were trying to figure out what was going on. And then that evening, I walked around with council member McDuffie, the neighborhood, to see what had happened. And as we were walking up, we took a left. This is a neighborhood called Bloomingdale. Historic, beautiful old neighborhood in D.C., well-known and it's an interesting part of D.C. for a lot of reasons. It's actually a lot of the topography of the city in that part comes down the hills to where Bloomingdale was. Turns out that's where Tiber Creek used to run through. Now it's all been channelized. So there was reason that all this water was collecting in that area because that was what the topography of the city was still telling it to do. Probably all of us in our cities have that case where we built somewhere and water still goes where we might not want it because that's where it's always gone. Well, it's gone in and what had happened, and I understand you don't have this challenge in Texas. I know you have lots of challenges in Texas, so this is not to say you don't, but this particular one I understand you do not have, which is combined sewers. How many people in the room know about combined sewers? Great. This is awesome. <laughs> We're, I mean, home, this is, this is the peeps. But D.C. is one of the cities, 755 cities in the United States of America that have combined sewers. When they were built, it was the best thing since sliced bread. And they're still very good most of the time. For those of you who don't know a combined sewer, the reason it says combined is that the sewer under the street takes all the flow from the sewer laterals, so all the sanitary flow goes into that pipe. But the storm drains from the street are corrected, connected to the same pipe. That's why it's called combined. And in this case, the rain, so they're huge, by the way. I've gone in a lot of our combined sewers, DC Waters combined sewers, and they're giant. This particular combined sewer, the Northeast Boundary Trunk Sewer, is huge. It's the biggest sewer shed in the city. It starts, the smallest part of the sewer is seven feet in diameter. And it gets ever bigger as it's going closer and closer as it moves along. And by the end, it's 22 feet in diameter. Beautiful brick arch sewers built like, and the way they're built, I did not know this until I went down there, they're semicircular, arched, and then there's a sort of a tilted edge to the side, and then there's a lip in the middle. And I've been told what that thing is called, and I always forget but to give a sense of scale, almost all of the sanitary flow flows in that, lip, in that little lip at the bottom. That's the sanitary flow. So or you go in there without a rainstorm, you could walk on the edges down and see where the flow is in the middle and the hole looks like, what's, what's this huge tunnel? What's this for, trucks? Or what, what's it for down here? Well, when storm hits, so much storm water is pouring off all the parking lots and the houses and everything else that the entire rest of that space is filled to the top, <coughs> excuse me, to the top. And what a combined sewer overflow is, is when so much storm water has flown into, gone into that pipe, it pressurizes. It's like a water main. There's now so much flow coming in that the pressure inside the sewer starts pushing flow out of it. If you're near a river on purpose, by design, that pressurized overflow is channelized directly to the river. That's called the combined sewer overflow. That's the problem we've been trying to solve in, in Washington, D.C., as is every other city that has CSOs, because that means untreated sewage and all the crud that's in the stormwater is going right to the river with zero treatment. 
But all the way in Bloomingdale, which is in the center of the city, there is no river for the overflow to go to. That overflow is going to the street. And the pressure inside of that pipe was so intense, it was blowing manhole covers off and shooting them off like an artillery piece. Fortunately, no one was hurt. Because those things, that boom, they would shoot off and they'd fly up in the air, pung down, and then it would be like a geyser of sewage and crud shooting up into the street, popping up like a horrible devil-made fountain. But the other thing that happened is that it doesn't only push up, it pushes back up sewer lines. And what had happened to, I'll come back to the numbers, but I remember one particular home. So we're walking around, it was on Flagler Street. Remember the street, remember the night, remember everything about it. But this particular place, walk around, there's a gentleman and he's moving furniture out into the, his front yard, clearly all wet. And we asked him what was going on and said, uh, I have to show you. So we went down the stairs into his basement. And the push from what was inside the sewer out on the street had been so intense back up the sewer line that it had pushed into his basement, it had blown out the connection at the toilet, not just come out the toilet, blown the connection open, punched a hole in the wall, filled the basement to three feet of sewage and rainwater, floated all of his furniture, and pushed it to the doors as it flowed out to the store drains till those flooded, which was horrifying. That wasn't just water, which is bad enough, and mold and all the things that happen with flood. That was sewage and pathogens in his basement that it's furnished. Well, we did the best we could that night. We walked street to street. We cleared all the storm drains. What was remarkable, remarkable about this storm was how fast it went by. Probably an hour later, there was no flooding at all. Streets had sort of started to dry, but not those basements. Over the next few days, I'm trying to remember the number. I think it was 278 basements reported, or, or, or people reported that their homes had been flooded. And I know, by the way, there's been far worse flooding in a lot of places, but this was a place that did not expect flooding. This was not by the water. This was not in the low part of the city. This was right smack in the middle, actually sort of up. It was coming down a topographical area, but it was not in an area where you otherwise would have thought, oh, we're near the low part of the city. Not that it's good, but at least we know why it happened. So DC, first lesson that we all know is despite the fact that that was an incredible storm, the likes of which have rarely been seen, not in total rainfall, but in the intensity of rainfall. And all of us know that's the problem. Our systems can handle a lot of rainfall. Well, even that can be a problem if it's too much. But we can handle five inches of rain if it falls over a long enough period of time. If five inches of rain falls in a half an hour, we are doomed. That's what happened in this case. There was nothing that DC Water was really going to do to solve that problem at the time. But boy, the public we serve sure thought so. If we are the water agencies, which we are, uh, those of us in the room, we're going to be held as responsible for these things because who else are they going to hold responsible? The good Lord? For the rain? No, it's, whether it's fair or not, we're the ones who are associated and responsible for managing systems. And we're going to be the ones that are held responsible. Where things started happening pretty fast. That was such an egregious story. But in fact, I said it was unexpected flooding. Not that summer. Summer of 2012, there were four floods in Bloomingdale with big storms that flooded basements. Four. Imagine you have a flood in your basement that's bad and you start cleaning it all up, replace some carpet, do then another. Do the same another, do the same, another, do the same. That's what happened that year. So by that fourth one, which was the worst of them, uh, we were in trouble. Uh, the mayor created a task force um, about what was going to be done, and press was all over it, doing interviews constantly about what was happening. 
And that next Monday, I called our team together in a room. And uh, I'm the lawyer at the EC Water, so I have no idea what the solution is. But I have to tell you about you all. My favorite times at DC Water, with any level of the organization, I don't mean level as in good or bad, but a frontline personnel or an engineer up in engineering, at any level of DC Water, my favorite moments when our team was asked a tough question to solve and respond. That's you. That's you, right? That's you all. It's like, you know, the eyes spinning on a cartoon. You all love it. If it's just a regular old day and nothing's going on, as much as we don't want crises and all the rest, it doesn't challenge your natural creativity and problem-solving skills. It's when the big problems happen, it's like, aha, here's a big problem for us to solve. Now I can use all that. And it's, no, think, it's just dig in. And my moment, walked in the room, I said, look, I'm not blaming anybody in this room for anything. It turns out that that area of Washington, D.C. has been seeing flooding since the 1880s because it is where a stream used to go. And as a matter of typing, there's, now that I looked at it, I had never really looked in detail. There's three different lines, CSO lines and sanitary lines, that all come together and come to one pipe. And there's just not enough capacity in that system. So right there at Flagler Street, First Street, V Street, all of those manholes were popping because too much system was going into one place. It's a design flaw on top of a topographical uh, uh, reality that made that front and center for this kind of flood. And it had been a problem for a long time. But that was before all the new growth in the city had added all the parking lots and all this new stormwater being generated. So it's getting worse. Called the team in and said, I... I no, it's not our fault. No one in this room was here when those pipes were designed. No one was in this room when Tiber Creek was channelized. No one here in this room was around uh, or has, can, has any control over these storms. But we're the ones who have to solve it. I don't know how. I have the faintest idea what to do to solve the problem in Bloomingdale. But I need you to solve it. If it's expensive, Make that my problem, because that's what I can work with. You've got to come up with a solution. And anything. I, I, you do what you've got to do. And those moments, by the way, watching the faces in the room, this is when you all are at your best. It's not like the solution came right away. But I could just see... People in the room are in different divisions, don't always work together. Of course, every organization has arguments inside the organization about what this, that, or the other. We're humans, that just happens. But when a big thing hits and stuff has to be done, we pull together, we drop it all, and we start solving the problem. I love it. I love watching it. I love this industry. I love what you do, primarily and significantly for that reason. Creativity, innovation, being able to solve things, and know it matters. We want to do this for the public. We can do this, even though no one in the room, when that started, had any idea how that problem was going to be solved. As far as I know, no one piped up right away. But everybody was there. So we created every office in D.C. Water started engaging on the problem. On external affairs, we created a whole outreach office. We took in every name of every family that had a problem. We didn't know what our financial or otherwise solution was going to be, but we certainly were going to start being active. I have to say, we planned a public meeting that next Saturday, so the week after, in the basement of a church in Bloomingdale. The toughest single public meeting I've ever done was that Saturday in Bloomingdale, going into the basement of a church, not quite a big as crowd as this, but it was a big, packed church. It just so happens that I had had a little surgical procedure for what we thought might be a skin cancer. It wasn't, thankfully, but I just had that the day before, so I came in with bandages. I can neither confirm nor deny that I put a little ketchup up there so I had blood running down, create some sympathy in the crowd. But in truth, I, it was not a thing. I'd already had that scheduled, hard to get it scheduled, but I had to be there. We all know those kinds of meetings. You cannot be present at those moments in the kind of jobs that we have. And the people were furious, and they were furious with me. Like, I had done this to them. 
These were their basements. These were their, their homes. This was something they didn't understand. It was the fourth time. And it was a financial calamity. It was just all these things. And that was a rough, rough morning. Um, but I was already feeling the seeds of hope because of your creativity in this room. And it turns out that this year is the wettest year in Washington, D.C.'s history. I mean, this past year, sorry, 2018. Big storms, just like 2012. We had that year again. Not a single flood in Bloomingdale. Not one. Because they fixed it. I'll just give you a synopsis of what we did. None of the things we did had we had on our agenda before we started. First, we did create a program to provide funding support for people who had damaged basements. Public agencies don't usually do that on the private side. We did it. You had to prove you were in the area and you weren't just using this. There's always bad people out there who try to take something like that and mess with it. It's just infuriating. When you, and I found those people stomp on them because it makes it harder to do the right thing for the people who need it. But for most of the people were honest, and we had a program, we set it up, we had a whole system, and it was all, I was whole from scratch, I hadn't done that before. Second, we sent our engineering crews out into the field to any person who asked how they could make their lot less floodable. Because it turns out all the flooding wasn't coming in the basement from the power. As the streets flooded, it would flow up the front walk and then go down the stairs into the basement. So there was overland flooding. Now, in Bloomingdale, if you look at all the old units, they all have stoop steps. I'm going to tell a story in a moment why some places have stoop steps for a different reason. But in Bloomingdale, they had stoop steps, I'm told, because there had been flooding in that neighborhood. And you didn't want to have your door to your basement or your first right at the ground level. You wanted to create a step. So if it flooded a bit or came back down, it wasn't going to go right in. But in Bloomingdale, like a lot of cities, all this new development came in. The new developers didn't know that history. They built all these new units, including on Flagler Street, Ground Zero, that not only didn't have a stoop, the walkway sort of went down and then the stairs went right to the basement. There was like a canal waiting for the stormwater to go in those basements. So we sent our engineers lot by lot, what can we do to recommend, we won't do the work for you, but we'll give you engineering recommendations about how to reduce the likelihood of flooding at your lot. Third, we started stockpiling sandbags in parts of the city so that we could quickly mobilize and help people put in sandbags for those who could not figure, do anything to stop the flooding. Fourth, we started investing in green infrastructure. We built green infrastructure north of the flooding area. So you come down the hills, right into Bloomingdale. There's some big lots up there and on the street so that it will absorb a lot of that rainwater before it ever got to the neighborhood in the first place. Fifth, we partnered with the Department of Transportation and built along medians on Rhode Island Avenue. That was where the worst flooding was. There's a big median in between. Dug up the median, put in big stormwater bladders to collect stormwater to reduce the pressure on the system. Most significantly though, and this was really cool, we were going, the DC Water is building this gigantic underground tunneling system that's gonna take all this overflow into a huge tunnel, 10 stories underground, that's 22 feet in diameter, it's 13 miles long. It holds like half a lake down there. But we hadn't gotten all the way into Bloomingdale. That's all the way in the center of the city. We weren't planning to get there until 2024. But the engineers figured out this cool plan to build a piece of that tunnel out of sync underneath one of the main streets, connect it with connectors to the existing sewer line, and then use it as a cistern. And then eventually when the big tunnel makes it all the way up there, it'll connect. And then the last one they did is it turns out that that area is McMillan Reservoir. For those who know DC, that's an old water treatment plant not used for I don't know, 60 years or something. The old sand filter buildings, it used to be they'd do clean water, put the water in, would percolate through sand. These are these old, beautiful red brick buildings. Everyone knows them if they drive by North Capitol Street, they're there. We took two of those, we cleaned out the inside, lined them, and used those as stormwater. They're still being used that way. 
Every single one of those steps was not on our list. Wasn't it? I didn't think of any of them. I helped raise money for them. But like I said, this year, the wettest, last year, the wettest year in D.C.'s history, no flooding in Bloomingdale. Why do I um, start with that story? First and foremost, um, just to say something about our industry and about you. Uh, what I learned, because when I arrived in the job, when I was persuaded uh, to take the job at DC Water, I never worked for a water utility. I never, only ever sued them, regulated them, and agitated against them. <laughs> in fact, I had sued DC Water. It was my, I regulated DC Water before I joined it, and guess what? I didn't like them. It was called DC Wasa back then, Water and Sewer Authority. Nobody liked DC Wasa. They seemed to be super powered at getting people not to like them. The mayor couldn't stand DC Wasa. None of the council members disliked DC Wasa. And I, I don't even know what that meant when I think back of not liking DC Wasa. It wasn't a person, it was like an entity that was who knows who it was. It was far away, you never talked to them, couldn't get through, didn't come out. You never met anybody from DC. Wasa, it was like a mysterious place that didn't talk to anybody. And then I arrived. Um, and I could not have been more wrong. You know, we were talking about this, Stephanie, and, and yesterday. Um, the biggest change that happened to DC Wasa, I have to say, was mine. And one of the things I would say to any of you, and this probably sounds Zen-ish or I don't know what the heck, but almost all change to me starts with ourselves, and I can just say that was true of me. When I came to DC Wasa, I was really coming in as the regulator. I wanted to do some things there to clean up some of their operations that I had been enforcing against. It wasn't really that all these other things could happen. No, it was, I've, I've been in this field. I've been an EPA enforcement lawyer. I've done run a state enforcement agency. That was my agency. I used to regulate it. I'm going to come in and do some of the things and require some of the things that I've always wanted to do. It was like a regulator coming in, and this was a big enterprise that polluted everything. The biggest discharger to the Chesapeake Bay, the largest freshwater estuary in North America, is Blue Plains, which is run by D.C. Wassa, the biggest. So you're a regulator and you want the environment, that's point zero. When I came in, uh, I was shocked and nearly paralyzed with fear that I'd made the worst decision of my life. In part because I didn't know yet. I didn't know the superpowers of you all. Um, I hadn't learned that yet. But the world that I thought was, oh my gosh, I've joined this agency, I'm getting to know it. They don't particularly like me because I was the regulator. And I was not a friendly one. So imagine having your boss come into an enterprise who had been the enemy regulator. So they knew me, but did not like me very much because of what I had been doing before. That doesn't surprise me. So these are hard headwinds. DC Wasa was the lowest ranked government agency in Washington, DC. And think on that for a minute. <laughs> lowest, not second, not fifth, not 10th, worst in DC. It's like, you have to work hard to get to the bottom of that list. Nobody trusted, and I call it the fist, I won't do it in great length. Some of you may have heard me talk about the fist before, but I'll come back to the first point on the thumb, because that's actually really positive. But the second was, is the conditions of the material was horrible. American, 2009 is when I started the job, American Society, they don't do it every year when they rate infrastructure. Well, 2009 they did. That was when their report card came out. My first year, D minus. D minus? I have told this story before. I teach a class at Princeton, and I gave an F once. Do you know that when you gave an F, right, you know I put it in, you hit the button because it's all electronic, and when I put in the F, I got a thing back. Whoop. Mr. Hawkins, Professor Hawkins, you must write more, a report on your F. Like, are you kidding me? A student does bad enough to deserve an F, and I have to write another report? That's wrong. So I think the best thing to do, when I didn't have this happen very often, is never give an F. Give a D. <laughs> it delivers the message. No extra report, government efficiency. But 
So I, so I figured uh, what the American society could not give an F, because if they give an F, they can't get worse. They can't threaten you. Oh, if it gets, we'll give you an F. D minus, they were thinking F. <laughs> for water infrastructure? This is not like a D minus for a sports stadium or something that's nice to have. This is something that under is the foundation of everything else. Third, so that's the, it was horrifying. And DC was just right there with it. We were replacing one third of 1% of the capital stock of the system in Washington, DC a year. That's a 300 year replacement cycle. The median age of a water main, median. The math people tell me that means half are older and half are newer, is 79 years. We have water mains in Washington, D.C. I had water main break right before I was leaving that fall. I just left at the end of 2017. We had a water main break in MacArthur Boulevard, main thoroughfare, upper northwest D.C. There's a there, our treatment plant is up. Uh, De La Carlia comes down. That's why a big transmission line. I was in Boston on a stage like this giving a speech when the call came into the bat phone. Water main break, MacArthur Boulevard. I went right to Logan Airport, flew back home, went straight to site, talking to everyone, doing the stuff I usually do. That pipe had stamped on the side of it, Captain Miggs. I guess the engineer would stamp on the actual work, work that they had done. I'm like, is that the Captain Miggs I'm thinking of on that pipe? I think folks were saying, yeah, that's that Captain Miggs. Captain Miggs became famous as the quartermaster General Miggs in the Civil War for Abraham Lincoln. That pipe was put in in 1858, and it was still in work underneath MacArthur Boulevard in Washington, D.C. It's an old, beat-up system that's not being updated. Terrific. Then the customers, most people in D.C., if you asked them where their water came from, would have said, I have no idea, or where it goes when it goes down the drain, I have no idea, or villains, poisoners. Because as you may know, the worst lead problem in the United States before Flint was in Washington, D.C. in the early 2000s. That was on the flashed over the front page of the Washington Post for weeks and months. Wall Street Journal, all New York Times, lead crisis in D.C. That's what people heard about D.C. Wassa. So if they knew us at all, it was we were poisoning them. That's a kind of a fourth. Weren't raising anywhere near money. Nothing like the kind of revenue we needed. I'll never forget when the CFO came in. It was actually the week of all these things that were happening all at once when I was thinking, oh my God, what have I done? Because he came in and he showed me the capital budget. Imagine you all, you're in your businesses, you get this meeting with a CFO who you don't really know that well. And he puts out the capital budget. Capital budget, DC Wassa, 2008. A year before finishing up, just as I'm starting, $225 million. A lot of money. He goes, well, Mr. Arians, that's not the story. 2009, it's got to go up to about 325. 2010, about 400. 2011, about 500. 2012, 550. 2013, it was going up by almost $100 million a year for every single year for five straight years. I'm like, what? Now I know why my predecessor... What a good time to leave. How are we going to raise $100 million a year more each year than we did the year before with a customer base that doesn't know us or thinks we're poisoning them? At last, everyone's saying, oh, there's no creativity, no other changes. This is, this is uh, we've all heard it said about us. By the way, I think there's a rational reason for that, even though I think it's the wrong conclusion is drawn. If what you're doing is delivering water, you can't be wrong. We cannot be Coke and try new Coke, completely flop, sell classic Coke, and make even more money. By the way, when they did that, they had all the money on hand. We tried new Coke, total failure. Who remembers that? Wasn't that funny? New Coke didn't taste right. Who, who, who thought that was going to work? But they made money because we all wanted classic Coke so badly that when they went back to classic Coke, demand went way up, higher than it was in the first place. It was a conspiracy. I know it. But 
They had the money to retool, rebrand, all that stuff. Who of us in a water utility or water organization said, okay, we tried this new thing, we spent all this money, it didn't work, we're gonna go back to the old thing. Right, with all the money I have sitting in my budget just ready for these sorts of circumstances. Plus, who's gonna train all the people to do the new thing? And when are we gonna get the inventory and the warehousing and all the stuff that's gonna go for the new thing? There's lots of reasons to go with what you know. We know it works, we know how to budget it, our employees know how to run it, we have the material in the warehouse, and we can't be wrong. This is not an entrepreneurial thing where we can try new things, no, no. The reason we had a lead crisis in Washington, D.C. is because the lead, the water treatment process had been changed from chlorine going into the water system to chloramine. That wasn't done to save money. It was done to reduce disinfectant byproducts and improve public health. It was a new thing they tried. The CDC and EPA supported it. Nobody knew, <coughs> apparently, that when you switch from chlorine to chloramine, it causes the scaling that's on the inside of the pipe to dis dissipate in lead leaches. So something had been tried that was supposed to be a good thing, and it caused the worst crisis in DC water's history. Lesson, don't try something new unless you're 100% 10 times over certain it'll work. <coughs> Excuse me. So that was the fist. Scared the heck out of me. And by the way, it's a fist that never goes away. No matter what we do, we always have challenges with a customer base that doesn't know us, with infrastructure that needs to be upgraded, with finances that are always challenged, and with a system that for rational reasons suggests that we stay with the things we know. But I would not be here today if I didn't find, however, that despite that period, I suspect I'm a pretty optimistic character, there were several months where I hope I didn't display it outwardly, I was feeling pretty dreadful. Not feeling like sick dreadful, like this bloody cold I've had for the last month. No, I'm talking dreadful. I just think, what did I do? I was a, I'm a lawyer. I was running an agency. I knew what I was doing. And here I was just this mess. What have I done? Until I realized the incredible opportunity uh, that was before us. And the eight years that I was at DC Water were the best eight years of my career. Incredible privilege, incredible memories, incredible relationships and incredible things. And the things that we did are things that anybody, oh, not only that anybody can do, lots of people are doing. And it led to that day with the floods, because that was in 2012. In 2009, we were still DC Wassa. Nobody liked us, and I won't go through all of it. But there's a lot of things that can be done to get to the point where when you hit the flood, there's a terrible crisis, you call the people in the room, you have the tools at your disposal to solve the problem to deploy your most powerful and important asset, which is the wisdom and the creativity and the commitment of us. And when I say us, it's the folks in this room and all the people who work for us. It's all the same ethic, different jobs. I don't mean hierarchy. Maybe I should do it side to side. Because the field people at DC Water, they're the ones who actually did all the work. I talk about it all the time. They're the ones out doing the work. But the engineering and the finance and the human resources, and it was just a procurement. Everybody played a role in doing this together. And everybody had these same attributes, this incredible commitment to service, this incredible teamwork when it was needed. Organizations have all their organizational gobbledygook, but when it, you need it, you know, at least what I discovered in our world, people drop everything, focus on what needs to be done, and they go. The question is, can we give them good tools to do that or not. There's tremendous wisdom on our staff. It's amazing what our people know, and sometimes they shake their head because the tools they've got can hardly allow them to have that level of experience and wisdom to shine through. So here are some of the things. First, I won't spend a lot of time on this. There is a program that has been yesterday. There's one that's coming up with the A team over here on building a relationship with the customer. So I won't spend as long time on that. 9.15, I have no idea where we'll be, but be over here, be there, be square. But um, the ability to communicate and connect internally and externally is where it all begins. 
When I left DC Water, one of my favorite moments was one of our very best engineers, Chris Piot. I will use his name in vain. He's wonderful. He did our whole biosolids, nutrient removal, clean energy project. He's brilliant. And he said, you know, when you first came here, I was mad at you. I was like, oh, how come? He goes, because you were hiring external affairs people. And I thought we needed engineers. We've got all these huge problems that the system needed biosolids being one of them. Blue Plains as a facility, if any of you have been there, is so big that every single day, 1,200 tons of crud was collected in 60 tanker trucks daily. 1,200 tons. Just one of those trucks rolled by, by the way, right when I was doing a press conference one right out in front of the building. Everyone at the press conference like lost their footing. That is aromatic stuff. And we had 1,200 tons of it daily. And there was all sorts of problems. The equipment was breaking down, lime stabilization and filter presses, all these things. And he says, we need an engineering. We need all these other things to fix that problem. But I get it now. I said, well, what, what happened? He said, well, think of what we did. We persuaded our customers to invest $500 million on a discretionary, non-mandated project to use a technology that had never been used in North America nor anywhere in the world at the scale we built it at Blue Plains, to take 1,200 tons of, of crud, biosolids, prepare it, put it in these canisters, heat it up at high temperature and high pressure, burn off part of it, cleanse it, it's sterilized at 700 degrees, comes out into a flash tank where the heat and the pressure is released, all the cell walls burst, then it goes into a digester, and because all the cell walls burst, the little bugs that eat that stuff go like, yeah, baby, because they can eat it really fast, create a lot of methane, create more methane, create it faster, get through faster throughput, take all that methane, we are the largest clean energy producer in the mid-Atlantic, is DC water in these gigantic methane-based turbines that fire off the power directly. So now we get a permanent source of clean energy that we don't pay for on site. Great for resilience. The biosolids that ends up at the end have been cut in thirds. It is now sterile and we are selling it in the marketplace called Bloom Soil. Look it up. There's a website for it. So we've taken something that was only a cost using old technology, always breaking down, always at a liability risk that the places that we're accepting and we're going to say no more, we won't take any more of that stuff. In which case we were going to face enormous costs to try to transport it. 60 tanker trucks a day we were spending money on, huge budget. Power is our biggest single line item other than personnel at Blue Plains. We just dropped that by a third permanently. And none of that would have happened had we not had a great communication scheme internally to know what the heck was going on, why it mattered, to our board and the people who made decisions to approve a $500 million project, to our ratepayers to support the rate increases that were needed for the $500 million project, for all sorts of advocates who were looking at biosolids, class, this is being used in people's gardens, is that a good thing, should you sell it? All, oh, every step of that way, from the internal communication to the connection to the folks where, who are buying Bloom relied upon a communication scheme with people who make decisions. Communications isn't a sideline. It's the way we present our case to everybody. All sorts of enterprises that make a difference. You come to the Texas Water Development Board for a, something, you better have your gaming gear. Do you know what you're doing, how you're doing it? What's the science behind it? What's the project? How is it going to be? Have you already built the relationship? Is there some sense of trust that we know who's going doing what? In my case, with the board, with DC Council, with EPA's home office is right down the street. What about all the advocates? Every environmental group known to humankind's got an office in Washington, DC. They're all watching us like hawks. I used to be one of them. Every one of those audiences needs and has choices to make about whether they support us or not. All our ratepayers, they've got to pay the upfront. It's got a cash flow positive outcome 
but there's several years of construction where there's no cash flow coming in. It's all going out. So the rate payer has got to hear the case to this and be open to hearing the case. If the first thing you ever do to a rate payer is tell them about the rate, that's a hard relationship to start when you're asking them for money. But if you've had all these efforts to talk and create and make relationships, then that's just a piece of the relationship. And it's part of service. And in our case, it was incredibly important. And by the way, it's really fun. We get to talk about water. We have a product that's connected to everybody. It's in every building, in every home. People rely on it all the time, but we found it was remarkably easy to make the connection. It wasn't hard, despite the fact that DC Wasa was disliked and distrusted. Everybody can do that. And by the way, you don't have to start with the big external affairs office that DC Water ended up with after eight years. We didn't start there either. I started with three people. Two had already been there. I hired one more, and then one more, and slowly over the years, we grew the office as we proved its ability to get the job done. We got every rate increase we asked for over eight years, tripled rates in Washington, D.C., tripled them. And it got them all approved. That day, when that flood was happening in Bloomingdale, what typically happens, what happened to D.C. Wassa in the old days, is that the reporters would write it slamming the water utility. It was the, sort of the instinct. And they didn't. There were some, there's always tough articles sometimes in the press, but what the relationship with the press means, and this is all I ever asked to the press, you've got to write whatever you've got to write. And if you've got to write a story that's negative about us, go for it. You've got to do what you think is right. All I ask is you give us a chance to tell our side of it. Because in the old days, the bad stories would just pop up. Everyone would be scrambling and no one would be prepared. No, if I heard about the story A, I'll give you my story. I believe I'll be able to tell you why you should write that story a little bit differently. So when they were writing about the Bloomingdale flooding, they weren't writing about the evil water utility that couldn't solve a flooding problem. They were writing about this topography and the fact that the pipes weren't too big and that the solution was going to mean building a much bigger system than it very expensive and tearing up streets. And that's why it hadn't happened yet. Not that it reflected beautifully on us, but it was setting context for what the system was. That's all we can ask for. Now, the next thing, innovation. All those things that were interesting with the green infrastructure, which we had not really done at scale with redoing the water treatment things. The natural power and fundamental attribute that is, that is in our agencies is creative people. I know I said that, yes, the fourth thing of that thing that was the crisis was that we aren't creative or we don't innovate a lot and the reasons why. But I think the wrong conclusion is born because it's not about creativity per se. It's about a system that for rational reasons doesn't drive us to try lots of new things because public health is at risk. We can't be wrong. We're always on. And if it doesn't work, we don't have a lot of money or time to replace it with something else. There are lots of good reasons to stick with what we know works. That does not mean that we aren't creative. I always think of what our crews, when we're going on that Matt MacArthur Avenue water main break, they're opening up the street. It's like trying to repair a car that has a Tesla motor, a Model T chassis, a piece of a Volkswagen, a piece of a Mustang, and still has connections for a horse and buggy. I mean, it's, we're, we're running on a system that has elements from decades of different times. And under pressure, not just the pressure of the water, but of all the customers who are out of service while we're fixing it, we got to get it fixed, well, no matter what we find. You dig up the street, oh my God, it's this. We weren't expecting that. The maps, uh, this is put in 100 years ago. Our maps don't quite show. We're going to try this. We're going to do. It's creativity on the fly daily. It's part of the DNA. Creativity is not... The problem, it is the strength of our folks, of you. So the question was how to unleash it, and how to engage it. Not that it wasn't there, it always was there, still is. And I found that extraordinarily 
possible. The question in our case was how to try new things without putting people at risk. So what we did at DC Water, we took this old building that we weren't using anymore. And over a period of years, again, this all didn't happen all at once. This, we just don't have that kind of money. You just keep at it. But we re eventually, today, if you walked in that building, you'd be like, wow, it's all brand new. Well, it's a big lab. But that happened over many years. Do that room this year. Do that room the next year. Piecemeal it together over time. And in that building, we have seven or eight small-scale versions of our treatment system. So we can monkey with it without doing anything out on the plant. And it's a great way to do innovation and research almost for free. So Virginia Tech, Bucknell, a whole slew of universities around DC Water sends their postdoc, grad students, PhD students to do research. I don't think we pay them at all. It's like servitude. But they're getting their deep PhD. They're not there because they don't want to be. They're doing research, so we get a top-level research scientist doing work for almost nothing. We've provided the facility. We provide projects that if you prove this, we can change the world with it. And we match it with our employees to make sure that research is about something that's relevant to us. So this is not theoretical research. This is research that would change the way treatment is done today. And that place is a hotbed of activity. There's 10 to 20 PhD-level projects going on year-round, Le has led so far, I think, to 16 patents at a public water utility. That's the kinds of things that are, we're, we're modifying and spending a lot of money at Blue Plains, changing it in accord with research that's been done in, that, in those offices. Lots of stories like that, and I know you all have them. Here's why I'm excited uh, about um, the future. Where am I? Oh my gosh, I'm almost done. Three minutes. All right, I'll do this really fast. Do you know that in 1898, the first urban planning, context, planning conference ever that anybody knows about was held in New York City? Big urban planning, New York City, London, Paris, Tokyo, these New York, Boston, Philadelphia, all came. And they had one huge problem that bedeviled every major city worldwide. It was the topic of the conference. It was planned for 10 days of deliberations with the best and the brightest, just like this room. I bet it looked a lot like this room, people just like you. And at day three, they disbanded in despair because they failed to solve the problem of the day, the urban planning problem of the day. Anybody know what that one was? By the way, when I was asked this question, I did not know the answer. Horse manure. Bingo. Wow, how did you know that? I did not know that when I heard this story. Horse manure, as soon as I heard it, I was like, of course. In New York City, there was 2.5 million pounds of horse manure being deposited on the streets every day. The reason that there are stoops in New York City is to get yourself out of the muck. The reason that there were high-heeled boots and shoes was to get your feet out of the muck. You would plow horse manure like snow, and at intersections, it would be piled up in the In New York City in 1880, 15,000 horses died and sat on the street until other horses could come and pull the friggin' cargo is away. And in the heat, it would all get dry and float around. Everyone would get sick. And in the wet, just imagine having all that stuff in a tree. But every, it was a god-awful public health aesthetic disaster. And nobody knew what to do. What are, we, have, we need horses. It's the only way we get around everything in the city. So they just couldn't figure it out. 20 years later, solved. And it was the combustion engine. Now, the reason I end on this hopeful note, since I have left DC Water, my overwhelming reaction is I didn't do enough. There's so much more out there that is possible that I didn't really have the time to lift my head up to see what it was. That's why these conferences are great, because you can come and hear and have a sense of what's going on out there. The internal combustion engine for water, I'll give a few examples, a water main. In the old days, meaning last year at DC Water, when we replaced water mains, I tripled the budget for water main replacements. But we replaced the whole water main. The water main is the cheapest part of that project. I don't know about Texas, but in DC, the Department of Transportation kills us. Because when we replace a pipe, they make us pay from curb to curb, go down the street the other way. I'm like, you're paving half the city. All we need to do is the dough. No. 
So when you do that, and, oh, then the laterals have to all be replaced. Well, that means you have to do the curbs because you have to go through the laterals. That means you have to do the sidewalks and then you're repairing people's fronts. The per square foot cost of replacing a water main is incredibly expensive and the water main's the cheapest part. Well, it turns out that's the old way, all the numbers that we hear. Our horse manure problem is the trillion dollars, the 500 billion, those huge numbers we hear about what it's going to be needed to take our old infrastructure and update it. But all those calculations are the horse manure calculations because when we were looking at how much we needed to spend to replace a water main, it was the old way. Replace the whole water main, all the laterals, all the sidewalks. But now there's a little gadget. You put it in. I, Buzz Pisker was here. Is he still here today? He was here yesterday on your panel. He's got all these, he does it here. This is a company called Pure that I just have forgotten to know. They put the ball that goes, just is pushed by water pressure through the pipe. It's these little sensors in it. God knows how that works. I'm a lawyer, but I'm glad it does. It senses what the pipe is as it's going through. And it turns out of that whole pipe, there's actually only three places where the actual pipe needs to be replaced. All the rest of it, if you clean and line it, it's going to last another 20 years. So you do spot excavations and installations, you clean and line the rest, you save 80% on what you would have spent on the whole thing. <coughs> on sewer mains, when you've got a big sewer that's sewer charging, the solution is a big tunnel that's incredibly expensive. The biggest project DC Water will ever do is that. Well, there's a company in South Bend. South Bend was, was facing a billion dollar cost to do combined sewers, just like DC. South Bend is much smaller. Median family income, I think, is in the 20,000s. So it was going to kill that city. So some professors at Notre Dame said, we can solve this. It's this. It's that the uh, spinning of the eyes. We can do this. And I know it's true almost every time. <coughs> you guys, you people, men and women, can do this. I know it. I've seen it over and over again. Well, they figured out that in a sewer system, if these are all the sewers coming down to your plant, it almost never floods everywhere at once in a city. So that night in Bloomingdale, that storm had gone through a piece of the city. It wasn't raining at all where I lived, at all, Zippo. And what they discovered that if you put sensors in and make sure those sewers are connected, you can manage the flow of what's going where and optimize existing capacity in other parts of your system that's out there. You don't have to build it. And they save South Bend hundreds, something, I wish I could remember the exact number, $600 million? That's what's possible today. The reason I am excited, the reason why this conference is awesome, Mary, the reason why we are at the lip of a new thing in the water industry, which is why I'm so optimistic, is it's not that the practices we did in the past are wrong. They were great. But like all things, you all are constantly thinking of new ways of doing things, new ways to communicate with the customers so they know what we're doing, so they're willing to invest, and that we can do these amazing things. There's new technologies that takes existing operating and existing capital money, so not new rate money, but existing money that you already have, and make it go much farther. Right now, proven, not crazy, used in cities all over, San Antonio, Austin, Houston, Dallas, I mean, Mad uh, Mansfield. Sorry about that. H2O, dual, rogue water. If you need help with communications, that's where you should go. But there's incredible opportunities with these new techniques. And most of them, what they do is they take the knowledge that our people have and allow them to do their jobs better. I'll end with... I, I have such respect, admiration, and, and I would I'd use the word and I, it, real love for the people who worked at DC Water in these places. Was, they're just such good people. I don't particularly miss the mayors calling me, the mayor calling me at the middle of the night. Uh, now that I'm not on the job, I do terribly miss the people I worked with. I miss wearing the uniform. Some of you may know I wear a standard issue uniform every day. I miss that. I miss seeing the team. I miss when the team, it just happened all the time where a team, they were excited to tell me and show me something that they were doing. 
Innovation was not something coming at them or being done to them. It's something that they were doing. Well, we figured this thing out. There's this product. But, you know, the way that it was working, well, we modified it. Here's how we're doing it. And look how it worked. And we were able to do this for a customer. To see that excitement in the team or that moment when there's a crisis, we've got everyone together. Let's solve this. And to see the eyes start to spinning, that I miss. But it is such a powerful asset. It's such a powerful ethic that I think it's extraordinary what we can do right now. You do have an incredible financing arm that has all sorts of capabilities of analyzing current projected needs, planning, future, connecting that to financing. I didn't tell any of my financing stories, sorry. But I love finance because it lets us do everything else. It's like communications. Sure, I love the engineering. I wanted to be an engineer, and I can't do math, so we know where that went. But I love the science. I love the engineering, but I love the finance. Without finance, Nothing works without communications. You can't communicate to the finance people or your ratepayers or your customers or your governing board. That doesn't work. All of these things work. No procurement. Well, I got to figure out how I'm going to select it. I'm a HR, how am I going to recruit all these good talent? By the way, all these new technologies bring in new talent. That's something we all worry about. We had tons of talent coming to DC Water because everyone who started at DC Water, I'd meet with them and say, be careful if you got a good idea because we might do it. People want to come to places where they can be engaged in their job, they can let creativity become part of their lives in the work that they do, and that is what you offer. And that is the value proposition that will bring uh, the next generation to follow in our footsteps. So I know I've overtaken my time. I love coming to Texas. I learned last night why the Texas flag flies at equal height to the US flag. And I'm now going to tell that story, because just to be honest, the rest of the country's like, oh, that's just sort of Texas. <laughs> what I learned is this is actually a question of international diplomacy. Texas was its own country. It wasn't like the Ohio territories, where it was just sort of became, it was acquired. No, that was a negotiation between the sovereign states for an alliance and a merger, not an acquisition. And in a merger, the parties are equal. Voila. But I, what I love about um, Texas uh, is I'm teaching this class at AU, and the stories about the cities that are now called Rust Belt cities, of what they were like 50, 100 years ago, was just you could feel the activity, feel the action, feel the excitement, feel it's not it's commercial, it's artistic, it's youth, it's senior, it's everybody's part of something that you can feel it's happening. And every time I come to your fair state, that's the feeling I've got. There are things happening in the state. You've got big water issues, but if there's any place in the United States of America or anywhere in the world that I think will be able to overcome those challenges, it's in the great state of Texas. So thank you all for having me this morning. It's been a delight. Yeah.